Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we like to end Saturday University session by having a roundtable uh, discussion where we can continue the conversation. And one of the great things is it's a, it's a chance to put the three professors who we've heard speak discreetly to put them into conversation with each other and follow up uh, on strands of the conversation that we didn't have enough time to follow up on earlier this morning. So with that said, if anybody has questions, we'll take, we will field them and finish up the day with a great conversation. Marsha. Of course, Rhoda. Um, can you tell us a little bit about German-Russian cuisine? German-Russian cuisine is pork, is the meat, and of course we use every part of the hog when we butcher it. You know, like bloodwurst, which is blood sausage. So I'm like, oh, you're eating yet. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but lard. <coughs> and so baking was done with lard. So I had mentioned strudel, but it's not the German strudel. Remember, German Russians are not German. <laughs> um, Strudel, uh, kuchen, um, of course pies of all kinds, you know, with the pie crust made with lard. Uh, it's not highly seasoned, it's just basically salt and pepper on the main dishes and the vegetables. Also potatoes are a mainstay of their diet, our diet. Margo's mother's Russian German, okay. and she wrote a book called The White Root on um, sugar beets and the sugar beet industry in Wyoming oh. and the Russian-German community connection to the sugar beet industry here. Oh, Margot's grandfather told me that as a young kid in Russia, mm -hmm. nobody in their community could speak Russian. They still spoke oh. German 250 years of living in Russia. And there was one man in the village, he said, who would read the Russian papers to them once a week. They'd all go to the plaza square, and he'd read the paper so they knew what was going on in Russia. But could each of you tell us, from, from your field and your particular um, academic relationship to food, is there one book that has made a big difference to you that you wouldn't mind recommending? And then I'm just also interested, it seemed like to me in all the talks, to one degree or another, um, the specter of the business of food. Um, was kind of shadowing the margins, and if you, and is there any way in which you think in in your particular area in relation to food about the business angle of things, the big business of food? It was a Michael Pollan book, but it was early book, a book called *The Botany of Desire*, if you know that book, um, which does histories of uh, the potato, the tulip, so it's not all food, the apple, and just tell some of the story, and and, and marijuana, and. <laughs> Um, he talks about the, the really fascinating, complicated histories of the way, the same way that he does even at Greater Lake in Omnivore's Dilemma, in his big first chapter on corn, which I think, I don't know what you think about that chapter, but it seems pretty interesting to me. Mm -hmm. It's pretty um, sound information. Yeah, it's both, both historically informative, but also gives a good insight into how particular food items go through these transformations over time, get adopted. I mean, the apple is, the history of the apple in America is by itself. I, I can't remember the, the, I think it's something like in 1900 or there was something like 17,000 varieties of apple in the United States and today it's like 7,000 or, or even less than that maybe, I can't remember the specifics. But anyway, the, um, that, that book I found really enlightening. And the Botany of Desire. And his little book um, also, the um, What to Eat, which is fun little yeah. um, recommendations for what to eat like, like don't eat anything that won't eventually rot. Um, <laughs> oh, there, what are those guidelines? Don't eat anything hey, your eat, grandmother never heard of. Your grandmother right. wouldn't recognize <laughs> wouldn't it. Wouldn't don't eat any food, food whose name you can't pronounce oh. and it's in English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and if no, the no ingredient food. list is <laughs> certainly. Yeah, if there are more than six things in the product, yeah. don't eat it. Yeah. So you have to buy the Hagen Dust 5. <laughs> You know, there are a billion cool books oh, in the world of food. Yeah. Yeah. I was, was thinking um, one that popped into my head, I mean, in terms of cookbooks, because you mentioned the explosion of the cookbook world, too. But an older one, a book by Diana Kennedy called The Cuisines of Mexico. And she was one of the very first people who would have used a word like cuisines, plural. 
And her one of her major points was you can't understand the food of Mexico without understanding that there are massive distinctions in the different communities that make up the Mexican nation and the different ways they understand food in relation to family and local life. And she's got lots of information. So it's a cookbook that's like a little text of her experience in Mexico. It's a little skewed, of course, because she was an upper class North American. So tech, what we would call Tex-Mex for her is kind of not Mexican food, right? No, it would be a different, she wouldn't put it down, I wouldn't think, no, she but it's not. She, yeah. <laughs> Later in her life yeah. when she went back to New York yeah. as trash. Well, she disliked the, the mushy Americanization right, exactly. yeah. of Mexican food. I use a book called Nature's Perfect Food by a woman named Melanie Dupuy, and it's kind of an academic book, but it's a history of milk in America, and milk production, and, and um, how our, uh, the industrialization process applied to milk tra has transformed um, our diet. But the really interesting thing about that is it's a lot about how the image of milk, why milk is perceived as nature's perfect food, how that idea got manufactured, basically, over the course of the 19th century, and then uh, taken up into the, the dairy industry as one of the ways. So we're reading, we're leading right into part two of the question. Yeah. What's your book? So, your book. Generally, there are science textbooks that I use. My personal reading, though, the omnivorous dilemma really spoke to me. And then um, the China study. If any of you are thinking about vegetarianism, that's a study done by a, a, a book written by an MD in the East somewhere and uh, promoting uh, vegetarianism based on the Chinese diet and a study that was done with the, uh, in that country. So, and that one really spoke to me. But, uh, I got personal reading and that professional responsibility. Though the book is now out of date, I find the parts on potatoes in Fast Food Nation yes. really yes. interesting. Yes. The whole idea that you could make uniform a food that comes from a product that has thousands of varieties. And the idea that in Brazil and China, the Idaho russet was introduced to plant fields to merely provide French fries so that you could go into McDonald's in Beijing and be guaranteed that the French fry would be, if not identical, so close that in a blind test you'd be troubled to tell whether it was an LA or a Beijing McDonald's French fry. <laughs> Right, so that idea of uniformity. We didn't really talk about that. Everything we've addressed has to some degree to do with the idea that there are distinct, discrete communities developing food traditions, either consciously, accidentally handed down, however they do it. But if you talk to any of the industrial food people, they will tell you the most important thing is predictability and uniformity so that a consumer doesn't have to wonder what might happen if I go through that door. It might be great, or it might be horrifying. Well, in the case of a McDonald's french fry, it's maybe neither, <laughs> but I know what it is. The introduction, like the reintroduction of nutrients, the introduction of um, the appearance of variety, like with the Pringles potato chip, right? So you, you have this absolutely uniform, literally, the shape is exactly the same in every single one, um, and then you just coat it with a chemical, basically, that's been made in a vat in New Jersey, and to make the flavor, a million different flavors. So I think I think one of the big mechanisms of the, of the major food industry is, is precisely that, reproducing exactly the same substance, but giving it, producing also the appearance of variety, diversity, right. choice, which are a lot are really. I know so one of my favorite etymologies has to do with food, and that's the etymology to the word companion, which comes from bread, pane, and calm. With. So your companion or your friend is the one that you eat bread with. And I know that all of you in your classes have brought students together literally over food, where you are literally becoming companions, breaking bread together. And so we talk about the way in which eating food together creates uh, community, society. Were there, in your experience bringing students together over food, have there been unexpected discoveries in the kinds of connections that people make? The students have found they have dissimilar tastes, which has surprised me because most of the students are from Wyoming. I thought they all had pretty much the same likings of food, but 
they do have different tastes, and they're adventurous with food, which really did shock me. I thought they were going to be shy about trying anything new, any of the new fruits or concoctions we might make, so that's what I'm recalling. Um, I have one thing I detest about my job as a university teacher. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. grading. Oh, yeah. Uh, I detest grading. And I have found that the food classes that I teach and the eating together helps break down some of the problem with that. I use contractual relations for grading. It's the only way I can allow myself to do it, which is I don't judge if you two are in my class and you know that you're on food teams preparing meals for the whole class. And I don't say, you know what, your sandwich was garbage. And John, you made a lovely <laughs> sandwich. You get an A, you get a C. I don't do that. The contract says if you prepare the meal, if you do the research, if you serve the class, you're fine. That's an A. So it's contractual. I noticed that eating with them breaks down ever further the whole dilemma of the authority imposing control on the situation and having the ability to punish them, right? You run a class through fear. If I don't do what you like, I get a lower grade. If I don't, blah, blah, blah that kind of starts going away and I begin to be a member of their community. We have one community. And they also, I'll tell you, I am shocked every time when I see how they come to have friendships as soon as we start eating together in the room. So it's just what you're saying about companion. Companionship is its hands. It's completely predictable and true. We don't have that for no reason. It's really beautiful, such that I have taken to running my graduate workshops as all dinner classes. My graduate writing workshops, which are very small, the graduate student level, six, seven students, we eat every week together and then have our workshop together, and it changes our relationship. I just recall a number of academic books that I've read where the, in, where the acknowledgments will um, acknowledge other scholars with whom the author says, you know, I've had so many meals with these people, and over these meals we've discussed the ideas that are in this book, so that, that the meal isn't functional. Work is getting done, creativity is happening uh, in other areas over food. Most religions are based around, uh, have a very large basis mm -hmm. around eating together. So, people do form relationships when they bring food. Everybody brings food to a couple of classes that, and we have a potluck meal, and I ask them to bring foods that mean something to them in some way. It doesn't have to be a deep connection, just something they like, even. Um, and that always, the conversation. We do that for the first time, like three or four weeks in, and the conversation perks up in the class just out of that. But I, I also wanted to say that this exercise, of, which is real common in food studies classes, to have them write journals, and then they end up exchanging their journals and writing about somebody else's food, even if they don't know who it is. Um, that exercise, where they get to look closely at somebody's food behavior, is a real uh, conversation starter, and they start to get interested in, well, who, who, you know, they want to know who this is or what somebody had to say about their food. Um, so it, that actual experience, whether literally eating or talking about their own food experience, is really central to, to the class to, to do that kind of work, to get them, um, you know, uh, to be commensal, to, to be together with food. You know, in my class also, before they ever make the meal, the food team meals together, we do have one potluck uh -huh. where everybody just brings a dish. And I do the same thing. I say, please bring a dish that has some meaning yeah. for you. Same, same thing. And you decide what meaning is. Yeah. Just something that's meaningful. And over and over, what I notice in that meal is the foods are often terrible. They're often terrible. <laughs> well, I get, I get no, wait, wait. Oreo. Yeah, they're marshmallow bars. Yeah. But then what happens is what they tell me when I say, now why did you bring the food? <laughs> Always. It's not the food, it's my grandmother made it for me oh. when I was a child. My mother. The lady down the block after school always had this for us when we came home from school. There's always a, an emotional link to a human community. So then the food, this is kind of like in the botany of desire, he's trying to address what is our affective right. relation. Right to the nutritional part of eating. That there is this thing we all know, there's a nutritional thing, if we don't eat certain things, we're not gonna survive. You know, but then when I ask them important, often it isn't like, well, because this is this fantastic food. It's always, because my granny made this, and my whole childhood, and when I look back now, if I put this in my mouth, all those memories come yeah. back. Yeah, the other interesting experience with that is that students who, just, just scanning the glass, I would never expect to, to, 
to be cooks or to um, maybe do something, bring something to the class because it has like, those kind of connections. Always surprised by who ends up bringing, ha having cooked the dish that their grandmother, yeah. they associate with their grandmother or their family. Yes, I have the opportunity to work with many people on their relationship with food and so often it is extremely distorted and if not pathologic and so in the process of uh, recreating that re relationship uh, we do processes of, of mindful eating and mindful food preparation. I'm curious if any of you include that in your courses and um, what experiences you might have had with that. This is something I do, um, especially with the meal management portion of that one course, as far as um, we have to eat slowly, uh, make conversation, you know, as far as that responsibility of the host or hostess type thing, but then bringing it in as far as that mindful eating, because, you know, the University of Wyoming had a big grant that was looking at mindful eating, and I really wanted to bring that in too. Thinking about um, what we're eating, how it tastes, how it feels in your mouth. Sometimes a Hershey's Kiss can be used in a, as an example, or a mint, those little mints, put in your mouth and really feel the sensation and, and feel the uh, mint opening up your nasal passages and all. Just being aware of your food. Um, I have usually some readings in food disorders in the class I do, uh, the problem of anorexia, bulimia, other kinds of things, and they often initiate hugely complex conversations because in every class there's somebody who is currently or has been through one of these food eating disorders. And when they begin to talk about it with their classmates, it's often like kind of scary and you know painful for them. So we do talk about some of these things that I think you're getting at in the idea of mindful eating, but I also think there's an aspect in which part of my class has to do with mindless eating, of um, not worrying, because part of these food disorders arise from a certain kind of attention. We all know it goes back to something Peter asked in that first question, about the ways in which certain body images are presented as correct in our culture and how certain foods, we, we happen to have a friend, my wife and I, who's a former very high flight model and who talked about the health dangers in her profession and the number of people in her profession with huge health problems as a result of really clear guidelines that were given about when and how to eat, what kinds of things that would guarantee they could remain the way they're supposed to be. So sometimes it's just, you know, if we have an array of foods and we don't worry very much, you know, you're probably fine. So maybe both things at once, if that makes sense to you, that would be similar kinds of things. You end up eventually getting around to the issue of food and guilt in general, you know, the degree to which we, um, most of us, at one time or another, have guilt feelings about what we eat or how we've eaten and, uh, you know, how we how we respond or adjust or, 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 or pay for our sins. You know, what do we, what do, we do that, that you know, this kind of uh, expiation of, of, our, of our guilt um, from food? Oh my God, that's, that's the scariest thing. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, like me, how many of you drink coffee? Is coffee good for you? Yes. yes. Is coffee bad for you? No. <laughs> A couple are left that way. Somehow I got trained early in my life, coffee's bad. There was no yeah. coffee in my household as a child. My parents drank, you may recall, a thing called Sanka. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my parents drank that. And I didn't, I didn't ever have coffee. I probably never drank more than a few swallows of coffee ever until I was 40. And then I became a complete fanatic of modern, cool coffee. <laughs> and I, I really like espresso coffee drinks, you know, and they're a big part of my experience. Like uh, my wife's family is Basque, and I've spent a lot of time in the Basque country, and that's a big part of Basque cuisine, too, is how, when, what goes on with coffee. But I, for the life of me, have a terrible guilt complex about drinking coffee. I'm sure it's going to kill me any minute. You know, it's, 
Thank you. Phytochemicals, all that pigment in it is healthy. But the thing is, you can say that to David a million times, and he still like, oh, I love being the subject of deeply rooted. You know, we're never going to get rid of them, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I can get rid of that one. Part of it is because also, how many times have we been trained in our culture that if you really like it, it's bad for you, <laughs> and that if anything is presented to you as, let's see, how to put it, that whatever is a pleasure can only be a pleasure because it is forbidden. We have the term forbidden pleasure. So when we want to make ourselves feel better, it's the chocolate pie. It's the, it's the, that I have an aunt right now who's 94. She wrote me a letter recently. She said, I'm doing so well. I got my dog and my cat here in the bed with me. They've known each other their whole life. They're like 12 now. I swear they're smiling at each other. And I got a big piece of chocolate cake with ice cream right here on the bedstand. And you know what? I'm eating dessert every single night before bed, in bed, and I don't care. I weigh 122 pounds. She's like four foot 10. She said, I weigh more than I've weighed in my entire life. I'm so happy. I thought, oh my God, Margie. You gotta come to my house. <laughs> you know, those, those sorts of things. You know, those are. They're, if you look at one of the things we do is look at, at food, a lot of food advertising, so food imagery and advertising, and, and that kind of attitude is, is highly gendered, right, in American culture. So, how many of those? As you watch, if you watch television commercials or look at print ads about food, if um, if overindulgence, I mean, if if um, great pleasure is part of the text of the ad. Usually, you're also going to get some subtext about, well, this is sort of a guilt, not guilty pleasure. Like if, if women, particularly if women, are depicted as eating, um, and you know, the, the, that's a whole huge topic yeah. by itself. It's well, her trip, of course, is yeah. I've given up all that crap. Right I'm now, right. old. Yeah. So I don't. It doesn't matter. I, now nothing matters. Right. I can do this. And she said, you know, I weigh 20 pounds more than my highest weight in my entire life in the last two years. In her 90s, nobody gains weight like that in their 90s. <laughs> original transgression within the Christian tradition is, Being a food is food, is a food transgression. <laughs> mentioned like um, that the body doesn't know to do a shortening and there and we know that life is somewhat adaptive at least. Is, do you guys have any thoughts or is there any science to, science to support that the human body, what we're referring to as junk food or processed, highly processed foods, can kind of adapt to that and will get be able to function just as well as opposed to like on raw natural foods to foods that we think are bad for it. You know, the scientific information that I follow in nutrition and health, it's the other way that we're not adapting. That's why we're ha getting cancer. That's why our heart disease is high, because we're not adapting to those processed foods. And there's nothing to suggest that even if no, the therapeutic end of it is always going back to natural food and preparing food yourself, not buying that food. But that's, like I say, what I'm reading in nutrition and health journals and uh, professional articles. In the old days of being a vegetarian, one of the critiques for vegetarian was you in trouble about vitamin B12. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of studies about vitamin B12 metabolism and where it is in plant sources, where B12 is. So for example, there's B12 in deep green leafy vegetables, but it's locked up in ways that the human body doesn't metabolize the way it can B12 in an animal product. And then a study was done on Seventh-day Adventists because they are vegetarians who won't like Many vegetarians are what's called ovo-lactic or something like, you know, they eat dairy products, eggs, and they can get B12 from other sources. And in fact, some researchers concluded that the Seventh-day Adventist community was metabolizing B12 differently than the non-Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. community. Now, I can't give you a source for that right now. It's years ago when I read that. But it would be very interesting to look up stuff like that. Specialized communities, that's not about processed food though, right? Or like, for example, we know that northern, the Inuit peoples and northern woodlands people who lived on high meat diets over thousands of years have different kidney and liver sizes in proportion to the body 
average than Europeans from the Mediterranean. That's an adaptation to their diet, but it isn't an adaptation to chemical changes in the diet. We don't know about I don't know. Does anybody know about that? I don't know, it's just it seems obvious that the speed at which these changes yeah. are happening yeah. in industrial yeah. systems yeah. so so they're so fast that the body, you know, the biological processes of adaptation are a much longer time scale. Mm -hmm. There is a non human recent example that's really interesting. And it is there is a there is a scientific monitoring community both in northern Europe and northeastern US and Canada that's been monitoring the presence of plastic residues on the ocean floor in the North Atlantic for about 45 years. And they're trying to keep track, uh, trying to figure out where do these plastics come from, what are they doing in the ocean, where are we finding them, what does it mean, blah, blah. In the last couple of years, they've discovered this tiny residue of stuff on the surface that somebody noticed and kind of scooped up, like imagine on a swimming pool, scooping the bugs up off the top with a net, and discovered it was plastic, uh, ocean floor plastics that are being metabolized by bacteria. And when they put it under really good scopes, they found that they could see all the markings of something eating this. And now they're like saying, oh my god, there's a microbe in the North Atlantic, which they also thought was completely impossible because it's too cold for that kind of microbial action. Is this making sense to you? Have you read of this stuff? It's fascinating to me. So they're so interested, they're excited on the one hand, because that means maybe our non-biodegradable products can be biodegradable because of the evolutionary change in microbes. Unfortunately, we aren't microbes at this point, you know, so maybe that's a two pace of change. I don't know. On, on, on that cheery thought of our non-microbial nature, I want to bring today's session to an end. Thank all of you for coming, thank our speakers, and we hope to see you in Gillette again in the fall when this program resumes here. Thanks, everybody.